All right. Just wanted to welcome everybody to our webinar today. We are very uh, blessed to have a uh, special guest, Dennis McMichael, with us today, who is going to share uh, some of the latest, greatest thoughts, insights, and so forth uh, regarding what's going on in the property and casualty landscape, especially as it relates to what's going on with auto homeowners, umbrella liability coverage and stuff. Uh, Dennis and I have known each other for, gosh, 25 years or so have worked together and uh, Dennis and, and his brother Gerald have actually helped me and my wife Rochelle with both our personal coverages and our professional coverages there at Impel Wealth Management in our building. And uh, Dennis is also a part of our professional advisory council. For those of you who may not have ever looked at this part of our website, but uh, uh, in the about Impel section of it, there's a part that's called Professional Advisory Council. And in that we share, you know, a lot of times we have clients that come to us and say, hey, we need somebody we can trust and, and talk to, whether it's about auto homeowners insurance, taxes, estate documents, uh, who can paint my house or who can, who can be a really good plumber, right? Whatever it is, like people ask us all the time and we try to give them referrals to people we know and trust and Dennis and his brother Gerald and their agency are certainly in that, uh, in that realm. So uh, we'd like to welcome you today. And uh, joining us today also is uh, Irene Zorowski, Certified Financial Planner. So Irene is playing the role of Nathan today because Nathan usually is the one uh, doing the Q&A for us. Nathan's in a meeting, so we get to uh, break in and see a new face uh, joining us today for that. So thank you, Irene. And uh, with that, we'll get started. I did want to just let everybody know, if you look at, there should be like a taskbar at either the top or bottom of your screen. And in that, there's a place for Q&A. And if you click that, you can type in questions. Uh, Irene will be monitoring the questions and will uh, um, you know, share those with us when we get to the end. We're gonna have probably 25, 30 minutes of presentation today, which is basically gonna be me asking Dennis a bunch of questions and him sharing his insights and wisdom with us. And then uh, we'll get into some Q&A at the end, hopefully have everything done in 40, 45 minutes. So uh, with that, for those of you who don't know me, I know we've got a few guests here today. I'm Jesse Hurst, Certified Financial Planner uh, and also Accredited Investment Fiduciary. I'm the Senior Wealth Manager and CEO here at Impel Wealth Management. I noticed in Dennis's bio, sorry to steal your, your thunder, Dennis, it says you got 35 years of experience. I just yep. hit uh, in August 36 years. So we've been doing this about the same time. Sweet. And uh uh, there's some stuff there in my bio for you, but let me uh, let me take a look here, pass this over to Dennis. And Dennis, why don't you introduce yourself? Tell us a little bit about you and your uh, firm. Yeah, uh, second generation agency owner. My dad started the business. He was he came right out of a factory, started it from scratch, worked his tail off, and uh, he hired my three sons, if you know that old show. Uh, me and my two brothers run the operation here. We have a location here in Streetsboro, an office in Akron. We're in, I don't know how many states, I lose track, 12, 14 states that we'll operate in. Any state but Florida. So for some of you that have locations down there, uh, that, that's, that's a tough nut down there. Uh, our claim to fame is we've won uh, multiple awards throughout the last few years. Grange has uh, acknowledged us as being in their top 1% of agencies five out of the last six years. And last year we won the, the uh, National Digital Innovator Award, fancy long name, uh, but it has to do with technology. And that was awarded to us by Liberty Mutual and Safeco Insurance. So there's the uh, quick skinny. There you go. So, so in my three sons, do you get to play Chipper Ernie? <laughs> uh, that's too old. I don't know their ages. I'm the youngest oh, of the three. <laughs> there you go. So, all right. All right. So we're going to get right into it, right? You know, we got four or five slides. We're not going to spend a lot of time on, on visuals today, but, but more on the, the content and the conversation. And I thought we'd start with some of the basics, right? You hear, you see clients come to us all the time, you know, and, and when you're dealing with wealth management, right, you're dealing with the comprehensive kind of holistic view of a client's 
overall financial plan. And part of that is risk management. And clients come to us with property and casualty coverages from captive agents, you know, captive companies, State Farm, Allstate, whatever, names you know where they have career agents nationwide, whatever. Uh, direct companies where they call an eight, I, you know, I call it the 1-800 dial a prayer, right? You you dial a company and, and you hope you get somebody on the other end that's doing it, you know, knows what they're doing, but they tend to think they're getting better, maybe better rates or more competitive rates from online companies like Geico and some of the ones you'd know. And then you've got the independent agent, which I know you are, right? If somebody asked me why a certified financial planner is great, I obviously have a worldview and a lens through which I see that world. You have a, a view as an independent agent, but why don't you tell us a little bit about the pros and cons of, of each of those, Dennis? And you got it. So, I mean, in a nutshell, when, you, when you're dealing with captive or you're dealing with direct, uh, they're shopping your account out to how many companies, Jess? I mean, it's just one. That's it. They just got one. It's the only option they have. So when your rates change or coverage is modified and you don't want it to be modified at renewal time, you give them a call and all they're going to do is say, ah, rates are changing. And let's talk about your deductibles or let's look at removing coverage. And so the captives and the directs representing one they don't have any other choices for you. Uh, what I like to say to people as an independent agent, we can go shopping with the large national companies. You know, I, I, could, I could name some large ones, Travelers, Safeco, uh, Progressives in there. Uh, then we deal also with the super regionals and the regionals. And if they have a change, we can say, hey, look, let us do the work for you. Let us shop your account out and we'll do all the work for you. And so that's the choice that we have. Whereas when you go captive or direct, um, they're not going to do that for you. And that means you got to go make all the calls. You got to do all the work yourself to find new rates. One more um, item worth mentioning here, Jess, is that Nationwide is a great example for us. And uh, by the way, I will not say a company name unless there's historical fact behind it, because I'm not here to talk down or bad about any company. But Nationwide found that the captive market didn't work. And they actually went back to their agent force and gave them the option to go independent because they knew that the independent system worked and it just wasn't working under the captive system. Captives, just so you and I are on the same page, that means that you represent one and you're technically not direct. So that would be State Farm, Allstate, Farmers, and American Family. Those are the four that are doing it right now. And then direct, of course, is your, your phrase. I like it. 1-800. And what was your phrase again? Dial a prayer. Dial a prayer. Well, and I, I like you know, it. you sit there and you go, because every time you call the 800 number, you're... You, you, somebody who doesn't know you and doesn't know your situation is answering the phone and giving you advice because you don't have a relationship with someone. Yeah. 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 When we get a call, uh, I, I have almost everybody's names memorized when I sell an account, just like forever. Uh, my wife gets mad at me. She goes, how can you remember all about this client and what kind of a client they are, but you can't remember to bring home milk. <laughs> and it's just, I just, someone gets in my head and I, and I just, remember who they are. It's, it's uh, you know weird. your priorities, right? And I always look at it, right? When you talk about, we've got one company, so we can only talk about deductibles or coverages or whatever, right? I always look at it as go, I like to have options. I like to have different levers I can pull, right? So being in that independent world gives you a lot of levers and a lot of options on behalf of your clients, I would, I would assume. Yeah, and let's go another step. Sometimes people say, well, all right, broker, that means that you're going to charge me more money because you're doing the shopping. And the answer is no, we're not going to charge any consumer any money. Um, sometimes people say, well, if I go direct, that means then that uh, I don't have to pay any broker fees. Well, just look at how many billions Progressive and Geico spends on advertising and that's where the commission dollars are going. It's to pay for all those commercials. Whereas when we sell a progressive policy, progressive doesn't have to pay any money uh, for any advertising. They just say, hey, McMichael, you do it. Yep, yep, exactly. 
All right, moving on to the second question, right? You know, there's lots of different coverages, right? Yeah, and I, I would assume, and this is where you're the expert, I'll ask you the question. I would assume there's a lot more variation in homeowners than there is in automobile coverage. I might not be right in that, but it seems like there's a myriad of options on the homeowners. But when you think about, you know, we always talk about insurance, whether it's auto, homeowners, health insurance, uh, liability insurances in terms of risk management, right? There's a risk that's out there. You can either assume the risk yourself, which means if something bad happens, you have to write checks as the consumer and pay for it, or you can transfer that risk to an insurance company and then you pay the you pay a premium to that insurance company to accept that risk on your behalf. So as you look at trying to balance the right coverage versus the cost and budgetary constraints that people obviously have. How do you go about looking at that? The number one call we get when someone calls us for as a prospect, the number one thing they say right out of their mouth is, I'm looking for a cheaper price. And so, Jess, you actually stole all my thunder. Uh, there, there is three costs in, in every insurance plan. There's the premiums, which is why people are calling us up. Hey, I want my premiums lower. The second is you got your deductible that you're going to have to pay out of pocket. And so where is that deductible? I'll come back to that in a second. And the third is going to be what's uninsured. An example of uninsured is potentially you've got an older car. You take it to liability only. You hit a tree. And so that cost to fix your vehicles uninsured. It's out of your pocket. Uh, Back to the deductible, um, you do need to be aware that companies are starting to increase the wind hail deductibles, and we're seeing a trend where that's going forward in a, in a rather crazy way because of all the weather storms. Uh, hopefully at the end, we'll have time to talk about current events and what's happening there. So premium, uh, deductibles, and uninsured, and you got to weigh them all out. Um, one more area that may answer this for you, uh, a part of your question, is I got a call the other day and they said, hey, look, I've got this vehicle. Should I take it to liability only? All right, great. Yeah, I'm not going to answer the question, but let me give you some help. How much do you think you can sell that vehicle for? And the client said, ah, about 7500 Okay, great. So you can take that vehicle and change it to liability only and you're gonna save X amount. In this case, it was, I think about $200, $240. Or you could take that uh, and uh, um, you could save that $240, but then if there, an accident occurs, then you're gonna to have to pay out of pocket to 7,500. Sorry about that, I got ahead of myself. Know. Or you could have us insure it and we'll pay the 7,500. So which would you rather do? versus savings on the premiums or savings on the back to the uninsured model that I used earlier. Yeah, if that makes kind, sense. It, well, yeah, it's kind of like how many years would you have to save premiums to make up yeah. a cost if it if it happened to you on that side, right? You know, if you had an event and it, and let's say there was a, a cost of $5,000, well, that's about 20 years of premiums at, at $240 a year to make that up, right? Yeah. And, you know, I, I, one of the things that we always talk to, to clients about, and I, I would assume there's an equivalent in your side, is that, you know, when people talk, come and they talk about cost, we talk about value, like, like cost is only an issue in the absence of value. If you're getting a value or you're getting a coverage or you're getting peace of mind, the cost probably isn't the biggest issue. Yeah. So you have, it's like this, Hey, you go to Walmart. Do you think you're going to get Joseph A. Banks product out of Walmart? It's not happening. You know, you're going after a cheaper cost. So we can come along and we can sell the main street USA product, uh, which is really what, you know, the companies on TV are selling. They're just selling Main Street bland products. Uh, or we can come along and we can sell you that high-end value product, Jess. It's up to your client. Um, we have a uh, spreadsheet. It, take, it takes me a fair amount of time to put it together. Uh, but we do a what you're currently at and then a better option and a best option. And they show what your current coverages are on the auto, the home, the deductibles. All of that goes into it. 
If I know the pricing, I throw that down into the model. And then I come along with uh, a better option and then an affluent contract. One of your clients that you referred to me, I did this for, and I'm, I'm not exaggerating. You've seen the numbers, Jess. They yeah. were paying, uh, I believe the number was 15500 a year. Big house, multiple vehicles, youthful drivers. And we got them down, I, I believe our numbers, I haven't looked lately. I think it was like eight grand or seven grand. It was yeah. crazy. It was like they, we, we cut it almost in half for better. Almost coverage. in half. Right. And yeah, we went over to that best coverage and we ended up taking that umbrella and jacking that up substantially. And how he helped pay for that umbrella is he took some of his deductibles and he increased those to a higher limit. And then that helped him on the umbrella premium. Yeah. Yeah. And it makes a difference, right? It's it's a big deal. And it's not like we always talk about multiple variable problems, right? Like there's not one issue. You got to kind of look at it in the context of all of those. So, yep. so good. Moving on to homeowners coverage, you know, how do you guys go about like structuring contracts, looking at recommended basic coverages? And then, you know, are there things that you're seeing industry wide that maybe are being oversold, overblown, right? That people are selling things that really are not uh, not maybe necessary. Or you don't really need to pay for. Oversold's a tough one. I don't have a ton of scenarios or situations to mention, uh, and I thought this through. And there's probably one that I can think of when you get an individual that is on Medicare, and so they have their maximum out of pocket on their Medicare plan. And I'm not selling Medicare here, but I want to talk about auto insurance. And so on auto insurance, the auto medical payments limit, when uh, someone carries a limit above 10,000, I just shake my head. And there's one particular company out there that likes to sell it at 50,000 for auto medical payments limit. And I just, it, it, it's just not needed, especially if you're on Medicare, um, and you really don't have a ton of uninsured passengers in your vehicle. Yeah. So that's the one scenario that could be oversold. Um, but to oversell sewer backup, it just doesn't happen. Um, how about you know, people coverages are really watching on, on the homeowner side? How about coverages that you think, especially uh, for our kind of demographic group, that 50 to 80 year old client? who's maybe accumulated some assets, what are some things they really need to be thinking about in terms of making sure they have adequate coverages on the homeowner side? Well, adequate co coverage is the opposite topic. That's what we think they should carry. Right. And so before I go on, let me talk about being oversold. Irene, I'm going to steal your thunder. I've got the Q&A up and someone's asked the question, uh, hey, look, my insurance agent is telling me that I must insure my house for replacement and they're using a third party vendor, is that the case with all insurance companies? The add on to that question is sometimes people will add, well, my market value is only, and they'll give you a number. So let's say the market value is 250,000 and it's a century home and replacement on that is coming in at 400,000. And so the question here by this individual is, can I insure it for lower than replacement? I only know one company that will do that, and we represent them. I, I know of no other company that will do a market value policy. Everybody, 100% of them, I'm sorry, 99% of them are on a replacement basis. So I wanted to quick answer that. As far as what is lacking, mm -hmm. uh, in the next slide, we're going to talk about umbrellas and what's a proper limit. That's a great one that needs to be reviewed. Uh, another one is backup of sewers or drains. So on this particular item, um, we are seeing limits from competitors that are oftentimes at 10,000. And just so just think about the basement that your clients are finishing out. They're not a, a 200 square foot build out in that basement. You know, some of these homes, they have movie theaters, they have bedrooms down there, they have kitchenettes. And 10,000, I just shake my head sometimes and think, that's just not enough. When, when that gray water comes in, gray water meaning non-drinkable water, when that comes in, 
Uh, if we can get to that within 48 hours, 10,000 might cover a finished basement to dry it out. Now you have all the damaged product that needs to be replaced potentially. Yeah. And you're going to go over that 10 grand. Uh, today, our minimum standard agency limit is 15,000. And if you have a large finished basement and it, it's pretty nice, high quality, uh, 50,000 is not out of the question. Not at all. Yeah. And, and so, and I, I know this client well enough. I hope that, that I'm okay sharing this example. I certainly won't share any names, but we had a client that, that any, he, he happens to be on one of our attendees today who, uh, who he and his wife took marvelous trip overseas uh, apparently on the second or third day they were gone, the water line into the back of their fridge broke and ran for 12 days. So they come home wow. from a trip of a lifetime to water running uh, all through the kitchen, all through the first floor, down into the finished basement and, you know, beautiful finished basement that, you know, everything had to be dealt with. And the the fights that went on between their captive insurance company, even if the agent tried to help, right? It, when 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 the insurance company adjuster comes in and says, the square footage of your wall is this, so our formula says it costs this much to paint it, but the painter gives you a quote that says, no, here's what it really costs. It, yeah. it, you know, that's where I would assume having an agent who can go out there and work on your behalf would become a really big deal. Yeah, we'll jump on the phone with claims and we'll talk shop with them. And we'll just say, hey, look, you know, something's not adding up. The contractor is at X amount. You're substantially less. Can you talk to the contractor? You two need to figure out the difference because there's no one that's going to finish this house for what you're estimating it at. Yep. And so, yeah, you got to have those conversations. Hey, real quick, that particular claim scenario you gave is not about, not a part of backup of sewers or drains. Uh, that would just be a water line. Um, that would just be covered underneath the standard homeowner's policy. Uh, hey, real quick, uh, for those that like to travel a lot and are worried about water while you're gone, uh, I highly recommend that you install an automatic water shutoff. And this is something that's been newer as of late as far as discount that insurance companies are providing. And so here's how this thing works. It'll tell you if you have a leak in your toilet. I'm not exaggerating. I own one of these. If I have a leak in the toilet, it'll do a test twice a day and it'll say your toilet's running. Uh, you then have five minutes to override the system or the water shutting off. Uh, if you're out of town and that uh, you said a refrigerator line started to yeah. run yep. within 60 minutes, it'll say, hey, you've got a leak. I can get a phone call if I want, an email if I want and a text if I want, I get all three, believe it or not. Yep. And uh, I have five minutes to override the system or it is shutting off the water for the whole house. It is an incredible product. It costs about $400 to buy and it costs a plumber to install it, which is, uh, I don't know, three to $500. I don't know what plumbers are running. Plumbers are running a lot, right? If, if anybody's out there <laughs> who has, who has, Children who are thinking about going to college and running up fifty, sixty thousand dollars of student loan debt to get a degree in sociology and make forty thousand a year, you should send them to plumber school, trade journeyman <laughs> school, because we've got clients who have who have family members that are plumbers that work, you know, that are making six figures and setting their own hours. So, uh, so yeah. anyways, um, hey, um, last reminder here because we've got two more slides and then we're going to jump into Q and A. So if you have yep. a question. Uh, you know, hit the Q&A button, type it in, and we'll go from there. Dennis, you, you kind of alluded to umbrella liability coverages. So, you know, I would say probably a third to a half of our clients have some sort of umbrella liability. So the question's here, should you have it? How much uh, coverage is enough? And how do you balance that versus the assets that you, you know, your net worth and the assets that you have? Yep. Hey, before I go on, one of the attendees asked the question, what brand do I recommend for the automatic shutoff? And so the one that I own is called Flow, F-L-O, and you can buy that on Amazon. And it's uh, specific to the 
uh, main pipe that comes in off the street. So you need to know what that is, whether it's a half inch or three quarter inch. Okay. Um, so the question is the umbrella, uh, what do I recommend? Should they carry it? So the number one bodily injury limit that we see today when someone's calling us uh, today is what we call 100, 300 limits. Uh, to qualify for the umbrella, almost every policy out there is 250, 500 limits. At a minimum, Jess, your clients need to carry the 250, 500 limits at a that's, minimum. That's on their automobile coverage. Yes. So the first number represents I rear in someone and they're by themselves or the highest we'll pay for any one individual is 250,000. So that's what we say 250. The second number, if there's more than one person in the accident, how much do we pay for the total accident? So the most any one person, 250,000, the most per accident, 500,000. Um, to go from the 100, 300 to the 250, 500, two vehicles, two drivers in the household, no kids, one house, you're talking maybe six bucks a month. And we see that limit all the time. And I just shake my head because that's what my dad trained me to sell when I got in the business back in 1989, right? I, I was going to say, I think that's the coverage that I got when I got my first, when I bought my yeah. first real car. Yeah. So now they become a client of yours, Jess, and they're no longer buying their first car. They've got something there, whether a nice house or maybe no one knows that they have assets, but you know they've got them that you're controlling. And uh, that million dollar umbrella is so affordable. Um, I just had one today, it was $125. That's it, a yeah. single car risk, uh, one home, 125 bucks. Um, most umbrellas for two cars are in the $175 range. And uh, should you carry more than a million? Yes. And what I say there is to the client or to the prospect, whomever I'm talking to, is they'll say, hey, go back to Jess. He's your financial advisor. He knows how much he's managing. I don't want to know. For you to go to a five million umbrella is going to cost you X amount. We'll say four hundred and fifty bucks a year, and ask them if it's worth you spending four hundred and fifty dollars a year to protect five million, two million, three million, five million, whatever. Whatever, right? So there is a direct correlation between the amount of coverage you should have and the amount of assets you're trying to protect. Yeah, if you have a million in assets, you need a million umbrella, and yep. that's how I like to put it. Perfect. Put on the umbrella that covers the assets. Uh, one more piece that most people, uh, most agents will not discuss, and that is the underinsured motorist that's on the umbrella. And so this is not talked about hardly at all. Uh, we recommend it, Jess. And so you're driving down the street, someone rear ends you, you have the 250, 500 limits. Yep. So Jess will pick on you. You're driving by yourself, okay? Yep. Uh, let's say they're legal. And they're carrying 100,000 of coverage. Not bad, but not good enough. Their policy is going to pay you just 100,000 and stop. It's done its job. We then go back to your auto policy, and your underinsured motorist is going to pay the next 150,000 potentially. You know, you got to justify it. Right. And so you're going to get a total of 250,000. At that point, the auto's done. Noth nothing's left. Right. We then look at the umbrella. Does the umbrella include the underinsured motorist? And if the answer is yes, you'll have another million layer there, uh, or two or three or five, whatever the number is. That's a big deal, right? And it's not crazy expensive uh, right. from that standpoint. So. So last slide, and then we're going to get into some Q&A, some other Q&A that you didn't steal from Irene. So, <laughs> Sorry, Irene, I'm, I'm proficient. <laughs> so, uh, so, you know, money-saving tips, right? As you think about these three, you know, uh, choosing the correct deductible, yeah. um, you know, updating your occupation and education, so we know that, and then talk about roofs, because obviously, like, I, you know, after the some of the wind and hail storms we've had here in Northeast Ohio, you know, I looked around and like that neighbor's getting a new roof and that neighbor's getting a new roof, right? And so forth. So, so pick which one. If you want to start with the choosing the correct deductible, why don't we start there? What, what are your thoughts? 
Yeah, on the deductible, I like to use simple math. And then I let you decide, Jess, if you want to go to a higher deductible or not. And it's real simple. What is the break even? On the auto, you want the break even to be four years. I'll explain that. And on the home, you need the break even to be more than seven years. So if you take your auto deductible, hypothetically, from 500 to 1,000, your additional out of pocket, that difference is 500 bucks. If you save $125 a year, year one, year two, year three, year four, there's your break even. Uh, if you save $125, flip a coin because your break even is four years. And there's no um, advantage going either way in our eyes. If you say, hey, I haven't had an auto claim in 30 years, well, then it sounds to me like you've already looked at your history and it makes sense to pocket the savings. On the auto, if you, I'm sorry, home, home, if you go from 1,000 to 2,500, your additional out of pocket's 1,500. If you save $142 a year for seven years in a row, there's your flip a coin. And so with children, uh, if you have any on your policy, that higher deductible, we can justify it. And we can go the opposite way on the auto, and we can actually take your deductible and go lower, which is backwards, Jess, to a lot of your peers out there that write a lot of books. And uh, maybe going to a lower deductible might justify itself if, if the savings is there. Yep. Or, uh, I'm sorry, not large enough of savings is there, is what I'm saying. Yep, yep. Um, okay. Occupation education that's newer. Companies have just been coming out with that recently. You save 1%. 2%, not much. And then the roof. Hey, look, that roof, um, we're, we're having serious weather issues here. And so you need to update your policy when you get a new roof for two reasons. One, you get a discount. And the second big item is if you have actual cash value on your roof, you may not know about it, but if you have that claim, you learn about it real quick and you're not going to be happy and you want to make sure that that rolls off. Okay. All right. Good. Good. How are uh, how are insurance companies looking at roof claims these days after after you know year you know three five seven years of hailstorms windstorms stuff like I, I would assume that you know years ago right we used to think that that all of these storm damage claims came from hurricanes in the coastal areas in Florida. Now we're seeing these claims here. How are the insurance companies responding to that? So Jess, we had a pre-call that people don't know. We had a pre-call Friday. Since Friday, I've received two company updates. And the what's happening in the current trends uh, is getting ugly. Um, there have been so many claims this year, catastrophic claims, which is defined by FEMA, uh, which is large claims, and they actually get a, uh, a storm number uh, specific to that storm event. And we used to get two or three a year. Yep. And this year we've had a dozen, 15 different storms that have hit. And so companies are doing a, a couple things. Uh, they are starting to, um, it hasn't happened yet, but once again, I've received indications that two of our large companies are going to be increasing the all peril deductible yep. uh, from 1,000 to maybe 2,000 or 2,500. It's still, I haven't seen anything in print yet. And the second thing they're doing is they're looking at adding a 1% wind and hail deductible. Now, 1% sounds pretty innocent until you do the math on a $500,000 house. That's a big old number. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. So good, good. Well, I appreciate some thoughts around that. We'd like to jump to q and I know we're uh, running right on time. We want to take about five, 10 minutes if we have some questions. Irene, anything else that's come in, in the uh, Q&A that you want to share with us? Yeah, we've got a couple of questions that came through email, Dennis, and thank you so much. This is really helping our clients, and I'm sure they're le learning a lot today. Um, the first question is really good. What is the impact of inflation on homeowners insurance and auto insurance? 
Yeah, I've already somewhat alluded to it that we're having a lot of issues. And so let's talk briefly about uh, sticking on the home for a moment. Uh, in, in this calendar year, uh, Jesse or Irene, I'm going to put you on the spot. How many in uh, how many one billion dollar um, catastrophic events do you think we've had in 2023? One billion in Ohio or nationally? National. Oh, I don't know. When, remember, billions a big number. Billions a big number. I would guess five or six. Any guess, Irene? Um, maybe eight or nine. Ah, well, if you were playing prices right, you're both under. So, Irene, you'd win. Uh, the number's 12. There's been 12 wow. $1 billion events so far this year. Uh, I was at a um, on an insurance advisory council. It was back in 2005. How do I remember that date? Because that particular conversation I had uh, is engraved in my brain. And here's what happened. In this meeting, we had four states that were represented from different agents. And an agent from Kentucky said, when are you going to get my homeowner's rates under control? And the company press said, when you stop having hail claims. Yeah. And I laughed. I'm like, ha, Northeast Ohio, we don't have hail claims. Now, you guys, uh, anyone watching this recording is going to say, yeah, we do. Back then, I'm telling you, we did not have hail claims. The weathers have changed. I'm not going to you know, get into the reasoning and the whys, but something has changed. And is it going to go back to normal? We don't know. Uh, what I do know is every year we have about two large claims in Northeast Ohio that I'm always looking out for. And if we only have one, our agency's doing the happy dance. And this year, we've probably already had eight to 10 large events. March 27th was a Saturday, a large wind event. Seven days later, I believe it was April 3rd, uh, the next major wind event that hit. Uh, June 15th, a tornado that went through Toledo that we had to buy a couple of homes or real close to it. Uh, then we just had the one a month ago on Friday morning at 1.15 a.m. Were you guys in your uh, basement with the tornado sirens? I mean, crazy. And it's not stopping. So you have uh, the storm events and then you have inflation. And inflation, I don't even need to talk about. We all know inflation is hitting. Just go uh, put on an addition and you know what's happening. Well, Dennis, I would think that just, and this is just from watching economics of this, right? When you think about materials costs, whether it's on building materials for homes or parts parts costs for replacement parts on vehicles, and then you throw in labor costs, I would have to think there's going to be some impact on insurance premiums. Yeah, on the auto, uh, one of the biggest things that's making our rates go up is where we get our parts. And so just look, where do we get all of our parts to repair a car? It's usually off of other vehicles that we've harvested the parts. And so used cars at one point were up 38%. I believe they've now come down into the teens as far as how much they're up. But just look at this UAW strike. And look what's going to happen there. Let's say the UAW strike doesn't get resolved anytime soon. And now you have less and less new cars, which puts pressure on used cars. Well, let's say they do solve the UAW strike and they get a sizable increase in their pay. It, it's going to be no different. It's going to make new cars go up. And which point used cars are going to have higher demand. Yeah. What we're anticipating Remember, I'm just the messenger on this, everyone. What we're anticipating is auto rates going up to the tune of 11 to 15% in the next cycle. What do I mean by the next cycle? Well, that would be uh, potentially two months into the future and beyond. Uh, we, I have on my another screen here, different companies that have announced within our agency what they're doing on their auto. And uh, we have one company here on their auto 
that is not an exaggeration. Uh, that is a large national company. Thank you, Lord. We have a very small volume with them. 12.6%, 13.1%. Uh, and these numbers, uh, you may say, hey, I've called my agent and they said it's only 5%. Well, the question is, did they have two rate increases within the last 12 months? So it really is in the low teens. On the homeowner's side, I'd love to say that we're going to be in that same category but the dust hasn't shaken out yet because the same company that said they're taking a 25% auto increase also announced a 27% home increase. Uh, but I have other home companies that are saying, no, we're not changing anything or we're looking at high single digits. So it is all over the board right now. Well, and you think about it and we'll take one or two more questions and then close up because we want to respect everybody's time. But you think about it, you know, the, the government's fiscal year closes September 30th, and last uh, Thursday, the government re produced its last CPI report, the September CPI report. And then within two hours of that, the Social Security Administration came out and said, hey, next year, the cost of living for Social Security is going up by 3.2%. And everybody goes, what do you mean, you know, in 2022, Social Security went up 5.9%. In 2023, it went up 87 Now it's only going up 32 but costs like auto and homeowners insurance could go up double digits. Yeah. That's that's a real issue for people. That's, that's real money. It is a real issue, yes. Um, Irene, if you don't mind, I know we're running out of time. I'm going to jump into these two questions yeah, that hit. Um, so the question is, why is Florida a tough nut? Uh, there's two reasons why Florida home insurance is a mess. Uh, one is because uh, you don't have much competition. Uh, two is because of hurricanes that aren't going to stop. Uh, and the unknown, putting too many eggs in a basket. Uh, imagine paying $10,000 for five years in a row, which is a big number. But then all of a sudden, you have a $500,000 claim. So Florida, it is what it is. Uh, and then the last question is, why are people in Ohio paying higher premiums because of disasters in California and Florida? The answer is, you're really not. Now, bear with me as I say this. Every insurance company has insurance above them called reinsurance. Reinsurance only impacts rates to the tune of 1% or 2%. So in reality, each state should be standing on its own. Does it stand solely on its own? I'm sure it isn't. I don't make the rates. But when there's major, major losses in Florida, we should not be seeing any impact in our rates. Okay. All right. Good. Oh, and then one more. Um, why am I paying rates when other people have accidents? That is insurance. Yeah. I don't know how else to put it. That's insurance. We all put into a pot of money. The companies take out. If they take out 96 on the dollar, 96 cents on the dollar, they're making four cents. Then they're making investment income of maybe 2%. And they're happy paying out 96 cents on the dollar. In today's economy, they're paying out to the tune of $1.15 to $1.22. And that's what's driving up rates. Yep. 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 Irene, anything else from the email questions that we needed to cover? Yeah, I think that last one kind of covered it. The the other question that we had. So I think we're in good shape. Yeah. I mean, like there's I have about six questions bouncing in my head. I'll talk to you about it the next time because I want to make sure that all of our clients who invested time with us, we keep them on time. So I want to say, first of all, thank you so much to Dennis for joining us. Remember how we at Impel Wealth can help you. We've got our weekly blog posts. You know, financial planning should be what drives all decisions that you make, right? Not the latest headline, what happens with the inflation report or where oil prices go or the latest geopolitical event. Remember, we're here to provide fiduciary and uh, portfolio management, fee-based advice, and uh, work with professionals uh, like Dennis and his team to uh, to help us with things. So with that, we're going to close. Thank you so much, Dennis. We yeah. are going to have this recorded and posted to our websites uh, and social media sometime soon. We'll let you know when that happens so that if you have uh, would like to watch it again or you know people that you think would benefit, 
please let us know. Um, please, if you have questions about this, you can reach either reach out to Dennis at Mc, Dennis or his brother Gerald at McMichael Insurance in Streetsboro, or reach out to us. We'll connect you. We'll be more than happy to to you know let our clients work with somebody we know and trust. So thank you very much. Have a great day. We'll see you soon. Bye bye. Thanks, Jess.